Michigan voters go to the polls this November and CMU Public Broadcasting again brings you Meet the Candidates, the election year series that gives you the chance to meet those seeking state and national office. Hello and welcome again to this edition of Meet the Candidates. I'm David Nicholas and joined this time by Tom Stobie. He is the Democratic candidate for the 101st district seat in the Michigan House. Uh, Mr. Stobie, thanks very much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you. Uh, we take our first few moments to give each of our candidates, each of our guests, the chance to share some personal information, a little bit about you, your hometown, and the experience that you bring to the, uh, to the uh, campaign. Okay. Yes, uh, I was born and raised in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, my parents both worked for the airline industry at uh, first Willow Run Airport and then Metro Airport after it was built. Uh, I attended uh, Ypsilanti High School and graduated in 1965 and uh, uh, attended Eastern Michigan University briefly uh, in the fall of that year uh, before I decided to volunteer for the Navy. Uh, I had always wanted to uh, serve my country and uh, it really actually felt an obligation to serve my country because my dad had served during World War II. Uh, so I had a great career in the Navy of four years and uh, after that was a little more uh, focused and uh, returned to Eastern Michigan and uh, received a degree in special education. Uh, and my first job was in a little town in Northwest Michigan called Frankfurt. Uh, and I, uh, we moved, uh, my wife and I and uh, my uh, first daughter uh, moved there and we, um, uh, I became the spe a special education teacher and also the head football and baseball coach. Uh, after about five years, uh, I received some opportunities to uh, uh, further my career downstate and we moved to Jackson and, uh, and uh, I was the, uh, also uh, a special education teacher along with uh, head football uh, and, and uh, baseball coach uh, and uh, moved then from the ranks of teaching into administration as assistant principal at Jackson High School and also the principal at Jackson High School and uh, finished out my uh, career as deputy superintendent. Uh, I retired uh, and uh, we, my wife and I, um, uh, built a house in back in Frankfurt where we had continued to go back because of the beautiful area that it is. And uh, some of my old football coach or football players uh, uh, encouraged me to apply for a one-year interim superintendency. Uh, and so I did that and uh, I uh, was fortunate enough to get the job, and that one year uh, interim position lasted nine and a half years. Uh, and then um, I retired the, this past December and uh, jumped into this race uh, that uh, I'm in right now. So the 101st district, um, counties that are, are to uh, the western, northwest part of uh, the state, but what counties are in that district, for those that don't know, kind of draws right. that map? Uh, it starts in Mason, Mason County, uh, goes up to Manistee, then Benzie, and then Leona. So basically it's Ludington to Northport, about 122 miles long. Along that coastline, though, uh, a lot of opportunity to talk to many different voters. As you approach this uh, campaign as a candidate, and then for the folks, the prospective voters that you've met, what has been identified as the primary issues in the campaign? Well, the main thing that I'm getting uh, in talking to voters is the, the concern about education and the funding that is, has been taken away from education. Uh, our, the second issue that I hear uh, is concern from senior citizens on the pension tax that has been put on uh, on them uh, starting in 2011. Uh, there, some of them are having a real tough time making ends meet and uh, that's made a big difference. Um, obviously in the area that we live in, uh, the environment is very important and uh, there are concerns uh, from our citizens about uh, protecting the environment, uh, allowing um, uh, 
uh, drilling in the Great Lakes, uh, allowing um, uh, unrestricted uh, fracking to take place uh, in our in our region, and so those are some concerns that uh, that I'm hearing all the time. When it comes to the question you mentioned uh, specifically for education funding. Uh, we've seen Michigan's economy go through a great deal of transition, population loss, and, and now we're at this point where many of the districts have faced a challenge for per-pupil funding based on the population, but there are also questions about how and how much of that money is being spent. What are folks suggesting to you? What would your proposal be to address that issue particularly? Well, I think that uh, initially uh, in 2011, uh, there was a cut of about $470 per student. Um, and that equaled to about a million dollars. Um, and, and so that's been taken out of the schools. I think it needs to be restored. Um, and I think that uh, we need to uh, give our school districts uh, the opportunity to give our students uh, the best education that we can. I talk to, to people all the time about, and I talk to my former colleagues uh, in schools, I talk to school board members uh, and, and parents, and uh, they're feeling uh, the effects of these cuts. Um, and it, they're feeling it in the loss of teachers, the loss of aides, the loss of programming, uh, the the, uh, the increased sizes of our classes in terms of numbers of students, uh, all of those things are, are, are things that, um, that are hurting our students and uh, it, that needs to be addressed. How specifically, what, what other areas of the budget then with, with a finite amount of revenue with Michigan's economy still in transition, what would be the proposal to restore more of that funding to spend less in some other way, restructure taxes uh, that are being applied, what, what specifically would be the ideas you would have? Well, first of all, uh, the, the billion dollars that was taken out initially, $600,000 of that was given to downstate uh, uh, corporations in, in the form of a tax cut. Uh, the other $400,000 uh, was given to community colleges. It seems to me when Proposal A was passed that it was, uh, it was meant to be funding for K-12 education uh, and not um, higher education in the form of, of community colleges. Not that I have anything wrong, there's anything wrong with community colleges. I think they're great and they serve their purpose. But I don't believe that they should be funded through, um, through Proposal A. Same question to a, to a certain degree when it comes to uh, the tax on pensions. Is that a matter of, of a repeal and taxes being then applied elsewhere? Um, if people are telling you that they want that undone, what's your proposal um, to then keep the, keep the state's budget in balance right. but address that specifically? Well, I think that uh, that has to be a bipartisan decision uh, to prioritize uh, uh, you know what's important, and uh, and uh, and rank uh, where these funds need to go. For the environment, um, as we said, and as as you described, it's it's the district right along the coastline. Uh, when it comes to what is being allowed, what is being proposed, whether we're talking drilling, whether we're talking fracking, it gets into the the balance between economic or energy development and protecting the environment policies that are in place either federally or with a DEQ. That's a lot of stuff to look at when, when you look at those. Uh, so where, where can that balance be achieved? Is it a matter of no to all of these, finding a safe way to do it? What are people telling you? Well, I, um, I don't think it has to be one, you know, one way or the other. I think it's a something, something that we can all agree upon. And, but, we, but it has to be the drilling well, first of all, I'm dead against drilling in, in Lake Michigan, um, as opposed to my opponent. Uh, but in terms of the fracking, I think it has to be safe. Um, 
the people that live around that have to know uh, what chemicals are being injected into their groundwater and, and, uh, and, and in the process. And, uh, and until we find that out, um, I think we ought to put a moratorium on it um, and, and wait until it is safe. We've got just a couple of moments left, but, but it, it seems that when we look at the environment, um, education as to the development of a workforce, it all gets to the question of the overall economy. And you've already mentioned the loss of population. We've seen that impact on the schools. What about the health of the district economically in terms of, of a reliance on what, be it uh, the continued reliance obviously on tourism mm -hmm. because of the location, what would be the best way to stimulate and, and continue to see growth in that district? Well, again, tourism is, is probably one of the biggest uh, areas of, of economics uh, in our district. Um, uh, we love to fish and we love to see tourists come and fish. Uh, we love to hunt. We love to see tourists come and hunt. We love to go to the beach. We love to see the tourists on the beach. I mean, it all goes hand in hand. And um, I, um, I just think that's important. I think we all, there, there's, an, there's another area we need, really need to support, and that's uh, agriculture. Uh, we have uh, tremendous uh, small farm agriculture in Northwest Michigan, cherry farms, apple farms, um, even even uh, some some dairy, uh, and they need to be supported. Also, uh, they need to have an infrastructure infrastructure in terms of of uh, good roads that they can transport their their goods to the marketplace. Uh, they need uh, they need access to. Uh, reasonable loans so that they can uh, have the capital to do the improvements that they need to do. Um, so those are the those are two things that are extremely important. And, and the third is uh, uh, we we rely we don't have a lot of large industry in, the, in Northwest Michigan but we do have a tremendous amount of uh, small businesses uh, in small towns uh, that uh, rely certainly on tourism, uh, both uh, summer and winter, and uh, we need to help them in any way we can. Well, we appreciate your time and attention to all of the issues that, that you've come upon and the voters have shared with you in the uh, 101st District as a candidate for this seat, and we wish you the best of luck with the rest of the campaign. Thank you for all joining right. us. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us as well here on Meet the Candidates. We have been talking with Tom Stoby, the Democratic candidate for the 101st District House seat uh, for this November's election. As always, we encourage all of you to get out and exercise your right to vote on Tuesday, November 4th. Thank you for joining us for Meet the Candidates. CMU Public Broadcasting invited both major party candidates for this office to participate in this series. Remember to go to the polls on Election Day. Hello and welcome again to this edition of Meet the Candidates. I'm David Nicholas and we're pleased to be joined this time by Representative Bruce Rendon. He is the Republican representative for the 103rd district seat in the Michigan House. And uh, for that office, he is seeking re-election this November to a third term. Representative, good to see you. Welcome back. Well, it's always a pleasure to be with you, David. Thank you. In our first few moments, we give all of our guests a chance to share some of their personal story or where you're from and the experience that you bring to the campaign. Well, uh, I'm from the little town of Lake City and up there for 32 years now and been a builder and a dairy farmer there and that's my background. I'm a married man of 42 years of my wife, Dare. We have two grown daughters and three grandchildren and uh, have contributed to our community and realizes, I realize what it takes to make a payroll. And I really think that has served me well as far as being in the House of Representatives and being able to make those tough decisions that we are summoned to do down there. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. The 103rd District, as we mentioned, uh, the office that you're seeking to represent once again, uh, tell us about the, the counties, the townships that all make up the map okay. of District 103. Well, uh, I represent five uh, northern Michigan counties right in north central Michigan. I live in Masaki County. But going north, I represent Masaki, Kalkaska, then to the east, Crawford, 
uh, south Ross Common County, and then east again to Ogema County. So have one of the largest house seats geographically of the 110. And for the travels through that district and, and uh, your uh, prior two terms in office, um, there's obviously a collective voice that has uh, addressed what people feel are the issues key to this 2014 campaign. You as the candidate, uh, they as the voters, what are they telling you? Well, really, uh, it's as it's been since I took office and uh, keep uh, getting Michigan to where we're uh, getting our population back and creating jobs. and. Uh, we have done a great jo uh, job in that regard, uh, getting those people back home. Uh, we've seen our population increase the last couple of years, and also we've seen job growth. So I've served uh, now uh, two years on uh, regulation reform, for example, and we've addressed and gotten rid of almost 2,000 regulations in the state of Michigan in my tenure. What among those would you say have been particularly key and, and as you look at this seeking re-election that, that you would want to still address when it comes to that issue of regulations impacting how we do what we do, what have been some of those initiatives that you have done and would want to do to, to continue to address that? Well, I've been listening very intently from my constituents throughout my district and really it is unhandcuffing uh, jobs to be created. For example, I come from two industries that are highly regulated and yes, uh, we all know there's a certain amount of regulation that's necessary, but uh, many years ago Michigan got itself second only to California in overregulation, and we've worked very hard to get it that way. We need to make sure that our employers uh, can create those jobs. That's where jobs are created. Is there still a question, uh, others have addressed this to uh, varying degrees, of Michigan or municipalities being consistent in, in terms of the level of regulation, and by that I mean so as not to exceed anything that's on the books from the federal government. As you looked at that, again, from the standpoint of being an incumbent running and, and the things that you would be looking at for a third term, what about that level of consistency to make sure that one is not outdoing the other and we're out of balance. Being very involved in the building industry, that was an area of concern and uh, we debated that as an association and in the legislature and we do not want, uh, regulations should not uh, supersede what we get fed federally. And I'm a firm support of local control and a lot of our local ordinances, a lot of things that we've done is we've also given uh, local government the power to uh, know what's best for their district also. Anything else in, in terms of uh, specific policies or initiatives that, that you would uh, feel that you have done or would want to do more of in a, in a third term if you were reelected when it comes to uh, just the overall job climate? I mean, you addressed it from a regulatory standpoint, but outside of that in terms of being able to create a good uh, climate for people to do business. Well, one thing I think that falls in line is all the work. We're so heavily tourism-based in northern Michigan that uh, we've uh, done a lot in that regard to uh, make sure people can come up to northern Michigan and enjoy. I had a piece of legislation uh, that involved uh, helmets on your own private property riding an ORV, and we got that done, signed by the governor, to where you can now ride on your own personal property without a helmet. And... Uh, Personal property rights have been a big issue with me, and that also gives a, our public a comfort to know that they can do what they will with the property they pay taxes on. You mentioned tourism. Uh, others have too. Uh, agriculture and then small business manufacturing seem to be at the center of all of these economic bases in many of our northern Michigan uh, districts on either of, uh, or on that front then of, of agriculture and how it blends in with a tourism-based economy or a manufacturing economy, uh, what sorts of things would you point to that you have done and those that you would want to do in a third term? Well, coming from uh, the ag industry with uh, being a dairy farmer and seeing that industry uh, grow from a $71 billion effect on our economy here in Michigan to currently $92 billion, and when the governor first took office, he put a challenge out uh, to become a $100 billion uh, industry. And I think we're headed there. Uh, we've shown that growth, $21 billion over a f uh, two, three year period. So uh, I would promote that, uh, continuing the, to unhandcuff those folks. 
uh, and let them create those jobs. You know, ag industry, there's a huge amount of jobs out there available. That industry is no longer just, it's yes, there's labor intensity to it, but it is a very high tech industry. Uh, traveling around the state and going to different ag processing plants, uh, the jobs are available and they're looking for people with uh, technology abilities. So uh, it's wide open in agriculture. Tourism too, our Pure Michigan program has been very effective. I would continue to uh, see that grow. Uh, I have uh, state parks in my area where we see up to and over 400,000 visitors uh, from the state and out of the state. I've had uh, hotel, motel owners tell me, Bruce, we've had up to 38 different license plates in our parking lot. So we just need to perpetuate that and uh, keep fighting for our, our uh, business owners. Do we have, you mentioned the, the level of training and the skill sets that have changed to meet some of these jobs. Do we have that workforce in place? You talked about the increase in population that the area has seen a bit of a turnaround after we lost so much population over the last 10 to 15 years. Do we have the workers with those skills, the training programs in place to make sure we can get workers for those jobs? David, that's a great question because coming from two very important industries, construction, building, and the dairy industry, farming, uh, we've got a shortfall there. And our economy has come back. I've talked to uh, quite a few of my colleagues in the building industry. They're extremely busy, and they're having trouble uh, getting technical skilled labor. Uh, we've done some legislation in that regard to where Bull Educational will help you qualify those curriculums for graduation maybe not having to take Algebra two or the language, but uh, we need to fit those jobs to our population, our young people, and uh, really it's wide open for those positions. And I, I uh, traveled and re uh, went through one egg plant, for example, and they, uh, they're new hires and they have jobs available. There was actually one new hire that had an egg background. so. Uh, you don't have to necessarily come from ag to get involved in that industry. Things that you have worked to uh, to see through then in the first two terms, what else would you propose to do? What else would need to be done if uh, elected to a third term in that area then? Well, it seems as though, David, we keep seeing regulation come up, and I keep going back to that, but truly that's where we need to make the changes to keep those industries moving forward and, and creating jobs. I will say infrastructure has been somewhat of an issue. I can give you a circumstance of my particular area where uh, the needed power, uh, electric power, uh, was needed to get three-phase electric in and conquer some of the needs of irrigation, of generation for uh, new plants. And so uh, the utility companies have stepped up with us to to correct some of those situations, and that infrastructure needs to be upgraded uh, to fit this this growth that we're seeing. Development then for more to create more power, or uh, the regulation to, to deal with a different form of power generation. What are they saying needs to be done? Well, we need more power, but we need upgraded power, where we can go to the proper uh, so that it's available for the voltage that's needed for these operations, based on what it was where it was at 50 years ago. So that's a big issue right now. And also we are looking at different forms of uh, renewable energy is actually a, a good thing to do. Uh, so those are the areas we're looking at. Infrastructure has been brought up by other guests on this program too from your, the first one that's addressed it from a, a power standpoint. Many have pointed to the issue of the roads, some mm -hmm. to uh, internet or, or uh, broadband coverage and so forth for cell phones and all of these areas. What about those in your district when we look at roads or uh, access to the internet? Absolutely. Uh, broadband and our roads are big issues. Uh, and I see, I've met recently with uh, Te uh, telecommunication people and some of their issues that they have and you know you can create a problem when roads are being redone and we need to do that but they have to move what's under the ground and that can be very costly so does that take money away from where it could go into expansion of oh. so those are some of the issues but absolutely roads has been an issue uh, broadband is coming to us uh, slowly one of our challenges is our 
our population growth and the density of that population. But uh, I sure am in favor of seeing that expanded and roads have been very proactive in that regard and would love to see. Uh, we had a very good bill in the House and passed that out of there. Unfortunately, it didn't make it through the Senate, but uh, I don't think the topics went away. In the last 30 seconds we have then uh, for all these issues you've addressed to, to hone that down, if you've got that single uh, voter, he or she getting set to go to the polls, what's that last message you want to leave with them? I, I just want to say, look at yourself and look at your family and are you better off today than you were four years ago? And I think if you're fair, you'd have to say you are. Uh, our unemployment has been cut near in half during this period of time. At the same time, unfunded debt is way down. We still have more work to do, but we have been very fiscally responsible, and that's what it takes to keep our young people here. We appreciate your time and attention in addressing all of the issues for uh, your district. Wish you the best of luck with the rest of the campaign. Well, thank you, David. It's always a pleasure to be here. And thank you for uh, tuning in with us as well here for Meet the Candidates. We've been talking with Representative Bruce Rendon. He is a Republican representative in the 103rd District seeking re-election to that office for a third term. As always, we encourage you to go out and exercise your right to vote on Tuesday, November 4th. This has been Meet the Candidates, a production of CMU Public Broadcasting. Both major party candidates were invited to participate in this series. For a complete listing of the air dates and times for this series, go to our website, wcmu.org.